Okay, good evening. I will speak about uh, different topics today, and uh, also a little bit about Avraham Avinu, but before that, a uh, few of the things that I see from, you know, from the news that I hear everywhere I go, uh, the situation in the marriages in the Jewish world is only getting worse and worse. It, it got to a point that really, really, if you don't want to become righteous, there's no point of getting married. That's how bad it is. First, a person has to decide, do I want to work on myself and make myself a righteous person? Then it's worth it for me to get married. If not, a person is destroying his life. Being, being married and not being ready to work on your character, eliminate your ego, your anger, all your desires and all this kind of behaving that you see everywhere you go is not maybe there's 101 percent guarantee that this marriage will fail briefly a month or two after i'm telling you i mean i i got to a point that i'm not even answering back all these people who call me i i mean i tried i tried but there's more and more phone calls coming every case it's a full-time job the people get married, they make a very fancy wedding, of course, sometimes they have the money, sometimes they don't have the money, tons of Ainara goes on them with all these fleshy things, and then, you know, obviously a month after the problem begins, sometimes even a week after. I know weddings that already in Sheva Brachot, it was just a matter of time until the get will be arranged. In Sheva Brachot already, you know? So, you know, finally when these people have problems, they want everybody to help them, but they don't want to pay, they don't want to cooperate, they don't want to do anything. They want people to work for them weeks, full-time job, and they do not even want to change. It's one thing they don't want to pay, they don't want to go to marriage counselor, they don't want to go to rabbis, they don't want to do anything. They want to take advantage anywhere they can. They want people to save their marriage. But nobody can save your marriage if you don't want to change. Marriage is about making a harmony in a house. If a person is every day or every two or three days is going into a big argument with his wife or with his with a husband, what miracle the rabbi can do for them? They can make one argument resolve. Then two days later comes another one. No, so the second one. Three days later another one. So they resolve that one. No, how long? That's going to be like this for 20 years, every two, three days, to meet, to talk on the phone, cursing, abusing, disrespecting, parents get involved, leaving the house, taking the children, going here, going there, police, 911, arrest, violence, what's this? Marriage? You know, so... Sometimes when I speak to these people, they're not, re they're not ready for the style, the way I talk. They w they're ready, and every rabbi they talk, they beg them, you know, and they, no, do this, no, why, no, give it a chance. When I speak to them the way you should speak to them, they get shocked. Oh, they realize all of a sudden, oh, we're very close to get divorced. Like, uh, I had a case, so I called up, the, so the guy said, that's it, I cannot take it, I gotta get divorced, I cannot stand it anymore, it's not going any better, so what is he expecting me? To beg him again, no, it's not so simple to be divorced, so I told him I 100% agree with you. Tomorrow morning, I think first thing you should do before you go to work, you go to the Beit Din, fill up the papers, and file right away for divorce. So right away he loses his speech, you know, he doesn't have what to say. <laughs> he was hoping you beg him again. The people think that you don't have anything to do in life. Just sit there all day and wait for the phone calls and be their servant. So what's the solution? For all the people who hear me here and all the people who will hear me in a, on the website, don't waste your time calling rabbis, not only to me, to anyone before you accept on yourself 100% to work on your character. If you don't want to stop being stingy and violent and angry and full of ego and full of baloney, don't waste people's time. Don't waste, it's not fair. Why should people be your servant? For what? You know? So don't waste people's time. You want to work on yourself, that's shlom bayit. You don't want to work on yourself, just go and get divorced and get it over with. Don't waste people's time. The only way to save the marriage 
is to put your nose down to earth. Avraham and Sarah never had an argument. Look at Avraham Avinu. One argument he had in his life with his wife? Of course not. You don't have to go that far to Avraham. I've shown you hundreds of couples that I know through the years. They don't know what to argue. They don't know. When the wife suffers, the husband is crying. And the husband don't feel good, the wife is panicking. The wife minds is, how do I make my husband happier than before? All the time. That's all she thinks about. Not to buy me, to give me, to do for me, this, that, all these stupid arguments. Your parents, my parents. I don't want to do this. Whatever you do, you want to go to this party, but you don't want to come to now. Like little three years old kids, that's how they behave. Who gave them permission to get married to all these people? I told that many times before, and I say it again today. If I had the time, and I had the money, and you need a lot of money for it, it's not so simple, I would open up a college. Not a college to learn history and math. You have plenty of those. A college, how to become a human being, and how to get married, and how to raise children. Those three things, because they're all connected. First, you have to be a human being. Without it, you cannot get married. Assume you became a human being. You stop being an animal. You became a human being. And now you can talk about getting married if Hashem wants. Not always Hashem allows. You know, if Hashem allows, fine. So you get married. So you get married. Now the next thing, you get married. You get, so you get married now the second time. You know, you get the first time you get married. And then... Hopefully, Bezrat Hashem, you have, you have children. You understand? So this is it. So this is what's going on here. These are the steps. First, to become a person. Second, then you're talking about getting married. Now, sometimes people say, but I'm already 30 years old. I'm already 30 years old. What is that my problem? You can be 70 years old. If you still did not become a human being, there's nothing to talk about marriage. But it's hard for me. I'm alone. I'm by myself. I once said it, and I will say it again. There are three different levels. There are three different categories, I should say, in the life of a person. One is happily married. And this category is shrinking nonstop. Every month, a little more. Soon, with the way things are, in the new generation, I don't know if this category will have any numbers in it. That's happily married. What's the second category? Miserably married. It's growing constantly. And what's the other category? Single. Be there and single. Everybody is willing to swear that, uh, you know, to be single is the worst. Oh, oh, look, I'm 40 years old and I never got married. I don't have children. I... What, what are you comparing? Of course, I would want to be my friend with all these problems that he had with his wife. At least he got married. Wrong. Wrong. Because being with a wife and fighting for 20 years and abuse one another, there's no end to your hell, to the gain home that you're going to get for everything you do. The next thing is, no, finally people agree that they need to get divorced because they don't want to work on themselves. No, at least they acknowledge now I got to get divorced. What's the first thing on a husband's mind? How do I cheat my wife? In a child support. Alimony, child support, all these supports. How do I cheat her? So right away, he knows that his income is not so big. So right away, right away he runs to court and he tries to show that his income is very small and they have to pay 17% of their income since anyway he's not showing anything on a book. So he's going to give her $200 a month. Very nice. Let's clap for this fool. He, 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 he fooled the system. He fooled the court. The child support cannot put liens on his account. Everything is fine. But Hashem is preparing his place in Gehenom and it's become harder by the minute. What do you think? You brought kids to the world and you just throw them with your wife and you disappear? And you go find yourself a girlfriend and you don't pay your obligations? Who, who are you cheating? <laughs> You have a kid. The monkey is taking care of their kids. In a safari. You ever saw a monkey that left his kid to die? They protect them from the lions, from the leopard. They throw, they throw their head into the lion's mouth to protect the kids. So you're worse than a, than, than a pig, than a, than a monkey. So what is it? I, I have to see how I cheat her not giving her anything. No. 
So what, because he wants to take revenge against her, so he's going to make his children suffer for the next 20 years until they become adults. What is going on here? Why? Because if he allow her to, he rents an apartment for her, which is really for his children, what's going to be next? She's also going to leave. So she's going to enjoy my, the rent that I'm paying. I cannot live with this. You understand? That's the reason why they got divorced. With this kind of character, what do you expect? So I'm coming to tell you for the million time, for you and all the people who would hear this lecture. First, Torah and Musar and manners and how to behave. And then you have to learn what does it mean to be a wife? What does it mean to be a husband? What does it mean to be a father? What do you think? Is jokes? A person go and become a doctor without learning what medicine is? To be a father is much harder than to be a doctor. To be a husband is much harder than to be a psychologist. So many cases in life, every day is a new case. You have to know what to do. When to retaliate, when not to do, when to pretend you didn't see, when to say compliment, when not, when to give a punishment, when to eat, when never to eat. You have to know, you have to be a psychologist because if you have four or five kids, each one of them is a different world. One kid, you give him a smack, you destroyed him, that's it. There's no way to correct it. One kid, you have to give him a smack a day. If not, he'll become a criminal. You have to know which kid is what. There's no system here. It's not a robot. Oh, smack, everybody. Compliments, everybody. No. There's a lot to learn, believe me. There's a lot to learn. And you know, after 20 years of being a parent, or a husband, or a wife, every day is still learning. Every day is still learning. Plus, you have to also remember, dating in a not modest way guarantee to make your marriage be there. Guarantee, no maybe yes, maybe not. Just get it out of your system. You're going to go and date people your way? Hashem will do it His way. Measure for measure. You want to do it according to the way of the Torah, in a modest way. You come to a middleman. The middleman is honest, is decent. He, he's doing the job properly. Then it's very good. So now when you finally meet together and you sit after dating and you check each other and you see everything is fine, nobody touch anything, no violations of any rule of the Torah, finally the time of the marriage comes, you do it in a decent way, in a very humble way, nothing flashy, none of all this show off, then there's a chance that this marriage will be successful. But even now there's a lot to, a lot to work. It's not hocus pocus. Sometimes they say, let's go to the rabbi, and the rabbi will give us a bracha and everything will be fine. Beloni. Nobody will help you with that, without yourself. Same thing somebody here mentioned before about one Jew that got arrested without mentioning names. And they went to a specific rabbi and the rabbi told them, give me such and such money and I'll get you out of it. It's Beloni. These things are, do not work. Be careful from this. The, you only hear about a case or two that was successful. They don't tell you about the 98% that they took the money and the people went to jail. And they got the worst punishment. This kind of news is not being advertised. They only want to hear you, they want, want you to hear what they're interested to make you hear. You understand? So you want to really save yourself or no matter what the situation is, first thing, emunah in Hashem. What do you need middlemen for? You have a direct line to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. A direct line to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You have a problem, speak to Hashem. 100% speaking to Hashem. We tried to help this, this one will do for me, this one will help me, and this one will help me, and this is the way we look. So, between me and you, when couples are dating today, What's the first thing that the guy is looking when he sees a girl, when they're offering him a girl? First thing he check. Before he check if she's righteous and modest and come from a good environment and she has good education. All these things is secondary. First thing, face and body. That's what he checks. Then he wonders why his marriage look the way it looks, like in a jungle. You behave like a monkey. Your marriage is a jungle. You're a human being. Are you the son of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? This is the way you behave. Only that. I'm not saying I have to look for the most ugly girl in the world. No. There's a decency here. A person has to be attracted when he goes out with a girl. If he has no attraction to her, even though she's a Sarai Menu, she's very righteous, no, 
it's a problem. You cannot force him. Also to force is very dangerous. But first, before you check all the things around, what kinds of car she drives, uh, you know, what kind of job she has, who is her father, how much money they have, this, that, how much money they'll give you to marry her, all this nonsense that I hear everywhere, whatever, first you have to check if the girl is good. Is she good or she wake up at 12 o'clock and drink for another hour and coffee and then two more hours to put her makeup and it's already 3 o'clock. <laughs> but she has a Barbie face. Very nice. Rabbi, everywhere I go, my friends give me a tap on my shoulder. Sihakta ota. Great. Wow, what a macho. No. We Jews? What's the word? It's like, like, you know, the, the Italians in the mafia. That's how they think when they find a girl. Busha v'chilpa. It's an embarrassment when you think about it. Everybody knows I'm right, but nobody is going to do anything with this. Tomorrow it's going to stay the same. And when he wants a girl, he's going to see ten girls in a wedding. Who is going to want? The one who looks the best. Why doesn't he ask the shatchanit over there, tell me which girl here is the most righteous one? Oh, now let's see if I like it or not. Doesn't go that way. Oh, who is this girl over there? Why? Seven feet tall. <laughs> it doesn't matter it has a midget. So there's a new style today. The, the guys, you know, four feet tall, and the girl seven feet tall. <laughs> when I was a kid, it was the biggest embarrassment. You're like this, and the wife is all the way to the ceiling. Today it's in style. The taller she is, and not only that, she put heels, another feet. She's, <laughs> she, she's giving her the hands. She's like taking her to the kindergarten. On top of everything, she has heels like this. No, if it's not mentally healed, what else? No, I'm asking you. If these people don't need psychiatrists, who else? Who does? That's what's going on today. First check. Shomeret Shabbat, 100% Shabbat? Oh, sitting by the pool with her phone. We're not driving. Very nice. But watching television on Shabbat. No? So who are you joking? Second, first I should say, modesty. That's the foundation. A wife is modest. That means she's ready to belong to one man. She doesn't have other things on her mind. The modesty... It's like a red line. You know, if a woman is not modest, that means she calls people to look at her. That means her mind is not clean. You want her to be the mother of your children? No. What, else can, what can we do for you? Mm -hmm. You chose it. Same thing, guys. When a woman goes on a date with a guy, he has a big yarmulke, sometimes even a beard. But everyone who passes by looks around. If I would be a girl, I wouldn't stay in the date another second. In the middle, I would get up, I'm sorry, I don't feel good, goodbye. Why should I waste another 20 minutes sitting with him? It's already showing his nature. Well, it's like, a, like, a, like, a, like a dog. Everything around him, he looks around. He <laughs> cannot watch his eyes. Are you expecting that things will be better? Maybe yes, maybe it will become Baal Tshuva, maybe. Most likely, it will be worse. What do you think? Right now he's excited from you. It's a fresh relationship. Six months later, when I cannot look at you, or after two or three pregnancies, then he won't have to look around. He will go like this, in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> he would hire a driver. He won't be able to drive. That's what's going on. Call my husband. I get a phone call, 11.30. Call my husband. I don't know where he is. Option number one with his girlfriend. Option number two, playing cards with his friends. Action, uh, uh, option number three, uh, in a club, smoking nargila. Option number four, uh, who knows, there's a, there's, she already has a few possibilities. Now I'm Sherlock Holmes, the detectives. 11.30 at night, I finish my lecture, I sweat, Baruch Hashem, very well. You know, now I have to go and search for her husband. Why? But she didn't know who to choose. Now it became my problem. Like I'm her father. You understand what's going on here? Yeah. And then they have complaints. I tried this, I tried that rabbi, I tried this, and it doesn't work. So I'm telling you, first of all, you have to be also very careful who you're going for advice. Because if you go to a marriage counselor and he's not religious, what advice is going to give you? Their advice 
it's an illusion, and I'll explain why. If a person, if a couple comes and complains that their uh, attraction is not as strong as it used to be, so they give them actually an advice to cheat on each other in a clean way, supposedly. By looking, by doing, by watching, all kinds of things, dirty things, to, re to revive their relationship. Everything the Torah says, it's a disaster. It's a destruction for your eternity. They give you this advice. So all these tricks may help for a week or two, and then makes the situation a lot worse. Show me their success, all these marriage counts. Oh, I want to see if they succeeded in 1% of their cases. They charge $300 an hour. In my opinion, they never solve one case. Because they're not educating the person. They're not telling you what your problem is. They're just trying to be a negotiator, to work up a deal. You don't do this, you don't do that. No, no, it's a part of being a marriage counselor. But if a marriage counselor wants to succeed, he has to tell the husband, my friend, <coughs> You have to take care of your anger. Here, read this book, read this book, read that, learn that, go to this, watch these ten lectures, give him medicine, it's like a doctor. That's what's going on. One other thing is, if it was up to me, I'm nothing, who am I? I'm not an authority, but if it was up to me, and I had the authority, I wouldn't allow kids in this gen uh, marriage, couples in this generation to have more than three kids. I wouldn't allow them. Religious, not religious, it doesn't matter. I would make it the law. Why? When Hashem gave the Torah and He said, Pro-Ruvu, He spoke about normal people, not people like us. People like us, we never mature. We are still kids. Each one of us is looking for toys. Every week he changes car. Every month another watch. Every two weeks he changes cell phone. Why is it? It's empty. He doesn't have a direction in his life. He is like a kid. The kid wants every week a new toy. He play with a car. Two days later, he kick it. Why? If he got a new car. So we have more expensive toys. We never took care of ourselves. We stay kids. The women are very spoiled compared to two generations ago. How can they handle seven or ten or twelve kids? If she's ultra, ultra, righteous... Haredi from, from Bert, she grew up with a great Talmide Chachamim. No, maybe she's mentally ready for it. There are, I'm not saying no, there's always an exception to the rule. But go and see. First problem, they don't have one minute to give attention to their children. Why? She works, he works. And then by the time they come home, there's tons of homework from this boy, from that girl, from this, and the Rebbe is calling, and there's problem, he needs a tutor, and go pick him up. Oh, how is he going to handle this? Then he has his employees, and he has his businesses on his head. It's just not working. And that's why there are thousands of religious kids, like bombs, on the streets. Go to Yerushalayim, see thousands of them sitting, one o'clock at night in a park, bombs, going to the theater, having all this uh, media dirt. Why? They grew up in poverty, in a one or two bedroom apartment, ten, twelve kids, their parents... Unfortunately, it's like it's Yat Mitzrayim. It's like working Avodat Parech from morning to night in between paying the mortgage and the bills and this and that and, and running to America six months to collect money to marry the, the, the daughter and then the next daughter. So in between that, they did everything for their children except educating them. And in schools, we have another problem. What is the problem that we have now? Since the rabbis are also not what it used to be, it's not what it used to be. So what's going on now? They're only willing to teach the kids Torah. But they're not willing to educate the kids. What's the difference? Chinuch means to make the kids people. If you see that you have a boy that is very angry, right? You have to work on his anger. If you see you have a boy that is very jealous, you have to work on his jealousy. If you see you have a boy or a girl in a class that they're very insecure, these problems will not go away by itself. They can only get worse. So you have to work on a problem. So he has 20 or 30 kids in his class. Five or seven or ten of them need special attention. You say, I don't care. It's not my problem. Every problem in a class, he call up the parents, come take your boy. I told you the story last week, no? Everybody likes it. This is the fourth time I'm saying this story just this week. 
because it's a good story. It's a sad story. It's funny, but it's sad. I told you the story. The, the, the Rebbe called up his father, the father of the boy. He has a boy in his class. And he said to the boy, to the father, your son is driving me crazy in a class. And you know, I mean, you have to come take him. Or if you want him to be in my class, you have to give him a pill. What's the name of that pill? Ridolin. It's a special pill that makes the kids not hyper. Give it to him, and I'm willing to accept him in my class. If not, take him home. So, the father, since he's in Israel, and you know, every medicine that is not approved by Kupat Cholim, by the government health system, then you have to go buy it in a private pharmacy. And then it's very expensive because it's imported from Europe or imported from America. So it's very expensive. Uh, not that medicine here is cheap, but in Israel, if it's private, it can even be more expensive if it's private. So now the father told the Rebbe, what? You know how expensive this medicine is? It's not approved by the health system. Forget about it. I'm not getting it. So the Rebbe said, no, it's your choice. You're not getting it? I'm not getting your son in the class tomorrow morning. It's your choice. But I don't have the money. So he said, go collect. Knock on doors. It's not my problem. It's your problem. Which the reality is that it's both of them problems. It's also the Rebbe's problem. But he threw it on the father. Because he doesn't want to do his job. That's what happened to us as society. So what's going on now? So the father has to go and buy it. So the father is worried. Since him and his wife leaving the house early in the morning to go to work, until they get the bus, until they get to work. And in Israel, they're opening the offices at 8 o'clock in the morning. Not like here, 9, 9.30. So at 8 o'clock, you have to be somewhere and you have to take a bus. In a rush hour, sometimes you have to leave at 6. So he said, we're leaving very early. Who is going to give him the medicine? So the rabbi said, give it to me, I'll give it to him. You give me the medicine. So he said, but if you give it to him, the whole class would know that he's taking the pill. So the Rebbe said, no, no, don't worry. I'm going to send him after davening in the morning to go make me coffee. And while he's making me coffee, I'm going to show him where I put the, the, the pills. And he has to take one pills every morning. So what happened? The boy, he got the medicine. He gave it to the Rebbe. Everything looks fine. One week, two weeks, no phone calls. Before, it was once or twice a day. No phone calls. No, after two months, the father is thinking it's too good to believe. Doesn't make sense. You know? From two phone calls a day, two months, not one phone call. Maybe the boy is on the street or something. He's not telling me. He started to suspect. So he called up the... He called up the, the, the... No, he called up his son. He said to his son, Tell me, what's going on? Everything okay in the class? He said, yeah, perfect. He said, no problems. The Rebbe never sent you out? He said, no, no, no. Everyone is quiet, all the kids are happy. The Rebbe is a new man, smiling all day. Not once he yelled in the last two months. Everything is perfect. So the father said, Why? Wow, you, so you're really that responsible? You're taking the pill every morning? So the boy said, What do you mean taking the pill? I take the pill from the closet. Every day I make him coffee and I put the pill inside. No, isn't, wasn't it that's what I supposed to do? I put my pill in the coffee. <laughs> So the, <laughs> the father just realized what happened. you blaming my son. You want to throw him to the street to destroy his soul when in reality you are the problem. <laughs> so right the way he called up the Rebbe. So you see? And the, the poor Rebbe didn't know where to hide. What can he answer? <laughs> boy not lying. is a little boy. He's putting it in his coffee. Because before he told him that he puts it in his coffee, first he asked him, how is the class? Perfect, everything is fine, your son is great, the class is great, no problem, you see? In the end, he said, sir, you are the problem. <laughs> That's what's going on today. It's very difficult to be a rabbi, don't get me wrong. A rabbi should get paid in, uh, in today's, if lawyers making two or three hundred thousand a year, the rabbi has to make double than them. To be a lawyer, how many clients you have a month? Twenty, ten? Each one of them, you hear his nonsense, 10, 20 minutes, an hour, another phone call, a fax here and there. Most, most likely your secretaries do everything for you. You go to court, you show up, you speak five minutes to the judge, and you make a lot of money. You know what, a, what it means to be a rabbi? It's like a psychologist for 30 kids. 
this kid wants attention, so he makes fun, he makes jokes, the other one is violent, this guy is cheating, one stealing from his draw candy. Well, like a zoo. They're climbing on the trees. Calm down, I said. No, it's like a monkey. Plus, he has to check their homework, and in the end, why do they pay them? What? They all live on welfare, especially in Israel. Thousand dollars a month. Then they wonder why the, why the education of the kids looks like the face of a dog. They wonder. In the old generation, you know who used to be the rabbi of the kids? The biggest rabbis. Today, every beginner rabbi, they first send him to kids. Should have been the other way around. The adults, they can have a mediocre rabbis. Because they already know, they went to yeshiva 20 years, they can handle the, the gemara or the, or the, or the halacha. Because they're already mature. The kids, when you give them direction in life, they need the best rabbis. Not a rabbi that himself has to re read four times until he understands what he says. Everything is the opposite. You see, we learn from Abraham Avinu about marriage and about raising children. Marriage, about his modesty and his wife's modesty. Until she was a very old woman, he never looked at her like a husband looked at his wife today. He didn't know how beautiful she is. He recognized it later on, after all these years, which means to show you how modest he was. Second, he had a son, he's a wild beast, Ishmael. One day Sarah comes and so says, we have to get rid of him. Throw him out. Throw him out of the house. The truth is, in those days, to throw a boy out of the house with all the pain, it wasn't as, as dangerous as today. Why? When he threw Ishmael, right? Where did he go? To the desert. Assume he gave him enough money, because Abraham was a very wealthy person. <coughs> Assume he gave him money, like what we call credit card today, to manage. What wrong, what bad can happen to him? It would be in a desert somewhere, become a farmer, a hunter, or something, and that's the end of it. Today, if you throw your son out of the house, even for two nights, that's the end of it. That's it. Why? He goes to 7-Eleven or to all these dirty places where all the pushtakim stand, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock at night. Where are they standing? They're looking for a place with light, with some activity of people. They don't want to sit in the middle of the forest at 1 o'clock at night. They get scared. So they stand in a, in a restaurant or in a place when it's open 24 hours and they meet all the dirt and all the people and one thing leads to another, pedophile, crazy people, this drug dealer, you know, prostitution. The next thing when he finds out in two days will take you 10 years to correct. So you solve the problem in the house for two days, now by the time you want to get him back it's too late. That's it, he knows about the world. Everything you did until now in yeshiva is gone. It's a problem. There's no, there's, and now, to keep him in the house, it's like a gun to your head. To get rid of him, it's two guns to the head. It's a no-win situation. Abraham Avinu, it's very painful for him to throw his son to the street. After all, he's his oldest son. So Hashem said to him, she's right, throw him out. So, so Abraham, with all the pain, he threw him, he threw him out. But the interesting part is, what did he give him? A little water and something to eat for a day or two, that's it. Send him like this. So it was kind of obvious that he's going to die with his mother. How is, you send him away, they gave him a little bit and that's it. And then the story begins. The angel came to her, he helped her out. And for 3,500 years we suffer because of that incident from the Arabs. Why do you think we suffer so much from the Arabs? From all the nations in the world, they're after us constantly, always. They're always anti-Christian and anti-Chinese and anti-Koreans because they don't like their idols and they don't like the European mentality and they don't like the United States. But if you ask them who is your biggest enemy, top priority to destroy, of course it's the Jews, not Israel. It's baloney that they say, well, we're not anti-Semites. We have a problem with the Zionist country. We have a problem with Israel. Beloni, what Israel? If Israel wasn't exist, you come after the Jews. Didn't they make one hand with Hitler to destroy the Jews, the Mufti of Yerushalayim? Well, there was no state of Israel yet in Hitler's time. He called Hitler and said together, I show you the clip, 
how they will help him to get rid of, to exterminate all the Jews. So what, what, what are you, so you lying that saying the problem is Israel? And it doesn't matter, because even if they give them the state of Israel and they reach an agreement with them, and let's say all the Jews would move to Arkansas, they'll come to Arkansas. And you know what? If you don't believe me, go and check in the United States. Whenever the Jews established a neighborhood, right away the Arabs are coming. A year later, you see halal meat, even here on Main Street. In Brooklyn, right away, they're all Atlantic Avenue, tons of stores. Whenever the Jews are, it's like a magnet. Where the mice is going, the cat is right there. There's nothing you can do. It's a part of the plan. So, this is it. Now, let's hear about some of the important things here. We said in a parasha, Vayi achar advarim ha'ele va'elokim nisait Avram. And after those words, after those things, God came to test Abraham. What do we learn from this Pasuk? That life is a test. So you see, Akadosh Baruch Hu has patience to take a person and play games with him, testing him. The Gemara asks, what things? Why the Torah didn't say what things? What things? If you write a book, and you say, and after that, after what? You have to write, after what? No, after the breed, after the wedding, after the, the earthquake, after what? That's why we have oral Torah. When we have oral Torah, so oral Torah always answer those questions. You go to the oral Torah, what we call Gemara, and the Gemara says, after... After those things, which means what? The Satan came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Satan. And he said to Hashem, You see, when Beyom Higamel et Yitzchak, there's two opinions in the Gemara what it means, Beyom Higamel et Yitzchak. One opinion that that's the day of his circumcision, in his eighth day. He's eight days old. So now he became finally a kosher Jew, which they circumcise him, a kosher Hebrew. So that's called Vayom Yigamel et Yitzchak. Second opinion is that he was two years old when he stopped breastfeeding from his mother. So he became already independent. He doesn't need his mother to feed him. Now you can put food on the table and go. And he eats. That's called Higamel. Higamel, Higamel means uh, to recover from something. Let's say a person is addicted to drugs. How do they say that he got out of it? Nigmal. Nigmal means got rid of it. That's it. He doesn't have that addiction. He doesn't have that need. He's not dependent on that anymore. He's not dependable. That's called Igamel. So, either way, is maximum two years old. Come the Satan to Hashem. Abraham Avinu makes a huge meal. He invites all the important people. And he's a very famous person in the whole world. And the Satan comes to Hashem and says, Look at, at your servant Abraham. He makes such a party. He did not even think to sacrifice one cow for you. One par, nothing. That's the gratitude that he has after a hundred years you gave him a kid. That's the, that's the Abraham, the righteous Abraham. So what's Hashem answer? Hashem said to the Satan, you talking to me about a cow? If I will tell Abraham to sacrifice his kid after a hundred years of waiting... He will sacrifice him without a doubt. You talking to me about a cow, especially you have to remember that Abraham had thousands of cows. What a cow for Abraham. It's a very wealthy person. He has camels and cows as much as he wants. No, so one less. Big deal. So, the Satan said, okay, let me see. I want to see. Now remember, the Satan is a prosecutor in Shemaim of every person, Jews, non-Jews, everyone. That's his job. That's his job. Prosecution, their job is to find you guilty. That's their job. But you have to do it in a kosher way. You cannot make up stories like today they do. Today, the prosecution, when they know that you're not so guilty, not so much, they take a bug and make it into an elephant. You know, all kinds of tricks. Not to talk about the horrible things that they do. They plant sometimes evidence against you. And many innocent people sitting for life in prison. Why? Because of their prestige, their ego. After five years working on a case, what are they going to say? We failed? We had the wrong guy? 
We have to make him guilty. There's no other way. That's how it works all over the world. It's people arrogance, people cruelty. It's all starts and finish with ego. Nobody wants to hurt his ego. We bury as many people as it necessary, as long as I'm still on top of the pyramid and my, my glory and my name did not get ruined. That's how it is. So, right after that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends Avraham, and you know the story, Avraham Avinu goes to sleep, as usual, tomorrow it's the, he say goodbye to his only kid after so many years, and he sleeps well. How do we know? Vayashkem Avraham Baboker, he got up in the morning. So that means he went to sleep. Why he goes five o'clock in the morning? Go five o'clock in the afternoon, 12 more hours with your only baby, no? How nice is it to play all day with your baby before you get rid of him, God forbid. No, no, no. Hashem said to me to do the mitzvah, I have to run. I'll tell you a story. You know, there's some mitzvot that you have an opportunity once in a lifetime to do. Once in a lifetime. So what is it? I tell you a very interesting story. You're going to like it, you know. It used to be in Europe, many, many big rabbis are buried in Ukraine, in Poland, in all these places. So, in one grave, right next to the Baal Shem Tov. You heard about Baal Shem Tov? Mm -hmm. The Baal Shem Tov started Hasidut. You know what Hasidut is? You know what Hasidut is or not? All the Hasidim that you see with the long peos and, and they have special hats and on Shabbat they pull a fair hat. That's called Hasidim. Who started that movement of the Hasidim? The Baal Shem Tov, about 250 years ago. So next to the grave of the Baal Shem Tov, you have a grave. What the grave says? It says like this. Ohev Israel Me'apta. That's his name. That's his Kinui. No, who is this rabbi that his name is Ohev Israel? What's Ohev Israel? Means a lover of Israel. Apta, it's the name of a city. Apta. So it says like this. Where is this grave? It's in a place called Mejibush. That's the name of the town. In Ukraine, Ukraine. So the question is, why his name is Ohev Israel? Me'apta, if he's buried in Mejibush, should have been Ohev Israel from Mejibush, not from Apta. Apta is a different place. So what's the story? Listen good to this story. The story is that there was a big rabbi in those days, very big rabbi. And he, you know, he was a, he was a rabbi in the city of Mejibush. And one day he moved from Mejibush to Apta. But before he became the rabbi of Apta, he wanted them to give him a high salary. He wants a lot of money. He's a, he's a famous Talmud Chacham. So you want me to come be your rabbi? I want X amount of money, perhaps double than the average. And since there was a wealthy town, they had money and they were not stingy. And they said, okay, rabbi, come over. We'll pay you what you want. So he came there. He was there for a few years. And after a few years, one day, he comes to them and says, I'm going back to my town. I'm leaving Apta, and I go back to Mejibush. The last years of my life, I want to be there, and I want to die there, and I want to be buried there. So they told him, Rabbi, it's not fair to us. Did we do anything wrong? Did we disrespect you? Did we offend you in any way? You wanted this amount of money, we paid you what you want, we never argued with you. Everything was fine. It was great years here. Why are you leaving us? So I say, let me tell you a story, and from that story you understand why. I say, many years ago, many years ago, there was a very big rabbi. And he was married, and he didn't have children. One day he got sick, and he was dying. And he comes to his wife and said, before... When I die, you won't be able to get married to anybody. Why? You will have to find my brother. I have a brother somewhere. I don't know where. Where does he live? You know, remember, there's no telephone, no internet, no way to locate your relatives. If they move from one place to another, that's it. You have no... 
you can go six years without seeing them. So he said to her, I know I have a brother, I know he's alive, I don't know where he is, and because of that you cannot get married. Why? You need chalitza. Even today it's like this. If a person is married and he dies without having kids, and he has a brother, the brother, according to the Torah, has to do yevum with the wife. He has to get her pregnant, and the kid that will be born will be called after the deceased brother. And that's like making him a home, making him a descendant. Since today people are not kosher when it comes to intimate relationship, so the, the Chachamim made a decree, no yevum, only chalitza. What's the other option, the Torah says? The Torah says if the woman doesn't want the brother to be with her, or he doesn't want to be with her, let's say they don't want, so he takes, they, they, come, they come there, he takes the shoe off, she spit at the shoe, and they have to do it in a bedding, and everybody announced in a court, that's, the, that's what a person that doesn't want to establish descendants to his brother, that's what you have to do to him, which is an embarrassment in a way, and after that he signed the papers, she gets it, it's like getting a get. And she goes and she gets married to anyone you want. But what happens if he doesn't give her no yevum and no chalitza? She, it's like a guna, she cannot get married. So what, he died, now she has to find his brother. Go find a brother when there's no telephone, no internet. Today you put it in Google, most likely he comes up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> probably have some criminal record here and there, oh, you see an article about him. <laughs> Something comes, unless if he's a famous person, then his name comes in a positive way. So in the old days, so the rabbi said, let me send a letter to every community and ask the rabbi if they know that person. Listen, this story is an amazing story. So they said, so they sent letters to all the rabbis and one rabbi responded, he said, yes, this brother is a member in my congregation, in my community. I spoke to him about giving a chalitza, and he agreed. Now the almana, the widow, she wrote in a letter that if they locate the brother, she will give him half of the estate of her husband, which means his brother, he takes half of what he has. He has houses, he has money. She gives him half for him to come and give her the chalitza. Very nice. No, so, so far everything is fine. So the brother agreed to do, but he has to travel with a horse for, for two days until he gets to another town. So that's why she was willing to send money. So what happened? So he comes to his wife. So he comes to his wife. Maybe he wants her to be allowed to marry to a Kohen. If he gives her a get, she's grusha, she can marry a Kohen. Anyway, so listen good now. So what happened from this? So now he comes to his wife, he says, I have to go out of town for a few days. I have to meet my uh, sister-in-law and give her chalitza that she'll be able to get married. And Baruch Hashem, we're not going to be poor anymore. We finally get a lot of money because my brother was an important rabbi and he had some nice money. So we're going to have some money, I'm going to come up with money. Now this brother also don't have kids. Both of them don't have kids. He doesn't have and he doesn't have. No. So he is going to, make, to do her a favor. So his wife told him, listen, let me ask you a question. Now this is two completely poor people. She said, let me ask you a question. There are mitzvot that you do three times a day. You go, you pray in shul three times a day. Every day, three times. Some mitzvot, you do one time a day, tefillin, talit, one time a day. Some mitzvot, one time a week, Shabbat, once a week. Some mitzvot, once a month. Some mitzvot, once a year, holidays, once a year, lulav, etrog, sukkah, once a year. And there are some mitzvot, maybe once a life, and not even that always, sometimes never. Here you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah that is very unique. How many Jews have this chance in life to have a brother that passed away without leaving any children to go and give chalitza? How many people have this chut? 
Now you have an opportunity to do such a unique mitzvah in the Torah that nobody else has the chance. You want to get money for it? Don't agree to take money. Do it for free. Do it for the mitzvah. So now, remember, it's a big test. This is a poor couple. Now she sees her husband is hesitating. She says, come, sign here, swear to me. Here, give me your hand. When you, handshake, when you have a handshake with a person, it's like swearing in bed din. You should know it. If you shake hands with a person, you must keep what you say. No matter what, you always have to keep what you say. But if it's a handshake, it's like shvua, like swearing. It's no, no jokes. So she made him swear. When he went there, he comes to the base din, she spit on the shoe, everything is fine. The story now is ready to leave. She comes with a bag full of cash. She says, here, this is your half of what your, husband, your brother left. So no, no, I'm very sorry, I'm not, now he's seeing all this money, it's enough for him for 10 years not to work now. He's a very poor person. But he said, my wife made me swear, she was smart, she knew, if I, if I only promised her, I would take the bag. <laughs> so now since I swore, uh, you don't play with fire, I said, no, no, I'm not taking the money. I'm not taking the money. So now, he went back home. Now remember, they married already for 15 years, him and his wife, and they don't have kids. Nine months after that day that he gave Halitza to his sister-in-law, his wife became pregnant and they had a baby boy. And this baby boy grew up to be the chief, the biggest, brilliant Rav in all Europe. Everybody see this kid? Like you don't want to leave the room. You know, these kids, sometimes they have kids, they ask questions like, you're amazed, three years old, well, <laughs> where does he have this sechel form? Uh, who is bigger? Yosef, Avram. How do you know he's bigger? But Avram did this, and Yosef did this. And they look like this. He doesn't get to your knee, his height. And he's thinking to yourself, sometimes I know people 40 years old, they don't have this intelligence. It's like amazing. Imagine such a chacham like this. So he told them, now, this, now remember, this is the rabbi. He's telling his community the story why he's going back to his town. He's leaving Apta. So he told them, do you know who was the boy that was born to this couple? It's me. So you know why I came to you? Because my father didn't want to take the bag from this woman, from my, from my, aunt, from my aunt. And she donated the money to Kupat Air, to the fund of the city of Apta. That's where she was from. She didn't want to take the because she said, I made a nether that I'm giving half of my husband money to you. You don't want to accept it. I don't want it. You don't want it. Let's do something with that. So she donated all the money to the Kupatair. Kupatair, it's the fun. They're helping people, whatever. So he said, I came to be your rabbi, and I didn't want to tell you, send me all the money that my father didn't want, because it's all mine. I'm supposed to inherit that. So the only reason I came to be your rabbi and to charge you a salary is to take what anyway is mine. You've been thinking, you're doing me a favor, you're giving me all this salary. The, where are you paying me the salary? From this fund. This fund, this money was my father's money. He didn't want to take it. So now, according to my calculation, this month, the amount is ended. All these months that I was here, that's why I cannot take any money from you anymore. I gotta go back to town, but I'm gonna make a fair deal with you. That my name will be memorized forever in history. Oev Israel from Apta, not from Mejibush. Nobody will know in the history that I was from Mejibush. Everybody will say I was from Apta. That brings you a lot of kavod to your city. Like they say, Agaon mi Vilna. How Jews know the city of Vilna, religious Jews? Only thanks to him. Right? You say, Agaon mi Vilna, every Jew go and check in a map. Where is Vilna? <coughs> Without the Gaon mi Vilna, who would even know that there's a place called Vilna? It used to be Rabbi Kramer from Vilna. They asked him to be the rabbi of Vilna. And he said to them, the only way I'm, that's like an opposite story now. The only way I'm going to become your rabbi, if you promise me you don't pay me any salary. So, ooh, very good. It's like killing two birds with one stone. Yeah. Getting the best rabbi in, in the area for free. Psh, of course, rabbi, come over. <laughs> now he comes. He had a little money, saving with him and his wife. And his wife opened a little grocery. 
a grocery. Uh, what do you sell in those days in the grocery? Olives, cheese, milk, bread, finish. No, you don't have 1,500 cakes, 500 kinds of, of cheese, uh, 400 kinds of salami. The stores, the size of the supermarket show what kind of losers we are. The bigger the supermarket becomes, it shows who we are. In the old days, people ate to live. Today, people live to eat. Supermarket became a, a going out event. Oh, the mother and all the kids going to the mall. There's a big store, tons of food, going with the cart. Everybody enjoy. <laughs> Get me this. In Muncie, they open the supermarket all the way from here to Main Street. You should see the place. <laughs> My biggest nightmare, to find one item over there, it's half a day. You got to bring the Gemara with you. <coughs> no, like this, Naim Ochazim Betalit, chocolate. No, she didn't want that. Ze Omer Kula Sheli, oh, vanilla. Oh, phone call. <laughs> That's what happened. So in the old days, they have a little grocery store. And you see, after a few months that he moved to Vilna, his situation in the house is better. A little fruit, grapefruit. Orange, peach! He didn't see peach for 20 years. <laughs> he comes to his wife. He says, oh, you got me a new Sh Shabbos clothes. What's going on here? We're becoming rich? How? He said, I'll tell you the truth. Since I opened that grocery, every person in town is shopping by us. You know why? Because they appreciate you so much that you didn't, you didn't want to get paid for your services. You're the rabbi of the town. You work for free. So they're trying to give it to you from the back door. So they're all shopping by me. So what would you say if you would be Rabbi Kramer there? What would you say? What would you say? Ah, Shemo. How Hashem always take care of people. See, I didn't want a salary. Hashem give me the salary. No, isn't it great? This is a lecture about emuna, about faith. What does he say? No, 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 it's a problem here. No, no, no. Quick, quick, quick. Let's see it and calculate how much money we need to live weekly. Let's see how much we need. Food, this, rent, this, by week. How much we need? Okay, now you open the store on Sunday morning. By the minute that you get in the register this amount of money that is enough for us to finish the week, you close the store, you put a sign on the door, what do you put? What is the sign? We will reopen on Sunday morning. Close the store, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, doesn't matter. Close and open next week. So she said, I don't understand. I never knew it's a crime to make a little money. We're not stealing, we have a business here. So you don't understand, there's two other groceries in town before us. Since we came here, everybody come to buy from us. We took away the Parnassah from two Jewish families. Is that fair? That I'm going to, because I'm the rabbi, they all come to buy by me? It's not fair. What about them? Just because they're not rabbis, they don't deserve to have Parnassah? No. This is a real Jew, you understand? Emunai Hashem. Don't need to cheat, doesn't need insurance fraud, doesn't need districts, doesn't need to mix the tuna every five minutes because it's from five years ago. <laughs> uh, excuse me, sir, it's from today? Oh, yeah, yeah, but it's from the morning. <laughs> it's like three o'clock in the afternoon, so he's acting like it's a dick. I have to be honest with you, it's from the morning. What do you mean from the morning? It's good, it's from the morning. No, usually we make in the morning and we make in the afternoon. This is left over from 10 o'clock in the morning. He doesn't tell her it's from 2007. <laughs> 10 o'clock in the morning. You know? Ay, 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 ay. They inject all kinds of things, killing bacteria, killing... Some of them, they don't just care. By the time you find out, you'll be sick at home. You won't know it's from them. Before time is running out, one last thing for today. You know that before HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah, we know that he went to all the nations and he offered them the Torah. And they refused to take it. They asked what's in it. Hashem told them what's in it. They said, no, not for us. And that's after that Hashem gave the Torah to the nation of Israel. You heard that before? Yeah. Okay. Now the question is, the Gemara asks, 
מפני מה קיבלו בני ישראל את התורה? Why the nation of Israel received the Torah? Why Israel? What the answer should have been? Because no other nation wanted the Torah, and the only one who wanted the Torah was the Jews, that's why they got the Torah. That should have been the answer, no? That's not the answer in Egmara. The Gemara says, "Mipnei sheIsrael azimem." What is the meaning of the word "az"? What does it mean? Hashem oz la'mo iten. Oz, it's strength. Strength. There's few explanation to the word oz. Strength. Courage. Amitz. Person that has oz, which means he has courage. It can also be negative. Chutzpah. Az panim. Why do we say as panim la genom or vosh panim la ganeden? Someone who is shy usually ended up in heaven. Someone who is chatsuf, has chutzpah arrogance, automatically goes to hell. Why? Look at his character. What do you expect? So sometimes azut, it's not good. We always say in the morning, eve az kanamer, ve kal kanesher, ve ratz katzvi, ve gibor kaari la sot retzon avicha. Az kanamer means be, have courage like the leopard. The leopard is a very courage animal, you know. It doesn't, it's not afraid. Hunters, people, photographers. He wants to hunt, he comes and hunts. It's very, very strong, very strength and courage. So why the Chazal is telling us, be like them? Because every animal has a skill that you can learn from it. What's the skill of, the, of this leopard, this namer, that is not afraid of anything? When he needs to eat, when he needs to attack, not in Baris, doesn't care what's going on, he does what he has to do. Which means, if you are a Jew, your yarmulke should be on your head no matter where you are. Whether you are at home, whether you are in the street, whether you are in Wall Street, whether are you in a court, whether you go on a date, whether you went to overseas, eh, you went to a wedding with your friends and relatives and you embarrass and you take it off, all these tricks, get it out of your life. You have to trust Hashem, this is the way Hashem wants you to be finished, the rest is not important. <coughs> your wedding has to be like Hashem wants, like, like your parents want, not like your aunt wants, not like your neighbors want. What do you care about them? Today they're here with you. What's going to happen in 20 years? They'll go where they go, and you go where you go. They're not going to be able to protect you from having a mixed dancing. What are you going to say? I respected my parents. You're only going to make their situation worse in their own trial. What do you think? It's like indicting them. By, if, if the FBI investigates you, and you bring up a name of someone that they didn't know about, what's the next thing that happened? He also get arrested the next day. You come and say, well, I wanted to make my parents happy. They wanted a nice, you know, show of dance uh, wedding, and they didn't want separate. So, also, so you're blaming them. So it's their fault. Bring them over. Let's take care of them also. That's how it works. So if you love them, when it comes to these things, don't listen to them. I always say, if you want to make a couple that have shalom bite problems, zug yonim. You know what zug yonim? In Hebrew, there's an expression, zug, it's a couple of doves. The birds, doves. Why? They're always together, mutsi putsi, love each other, together. You know, they're always standing together, the male and the female. When a husband and a wife comes to a religious wedding, they become like in their honeymoon, better. They never love each other more like they love each other in the two hours of their religious wedding. When they left the house, 500 curses. He's throwing things, she's throwing things, cursing, screaming, they sit in a car, not one word. She's, she's calling the lawyer, I want my get tomorrow morning. When they come to the religious wedding, now they put their show off, they hold each other. And then they say, I'm sorry, sir, you have to go to the right, you have to go to the left. It's men over here, ladies over there. What? I'm not going to be with my husband together in the same table? Ma, what's this? What are you forcing me? What is this? It's Iran here? No! No, we sit together. I don't care, so we're not going to come here. Just a minute ago, I wanted to murder him. He gave you one, you gave him two. Oh, all of a sudden, I come to the wedding. What? You're putting me without my wife? So that's a very good way. 
everyone who has a fight, send them to a religious wedding. Up oh, right away, they become <laughs> honeymoon. Why do you need marriage counseling? <laughs> no, that's it. That's the trick. So the, the point is like this. Really, <coughs> the nation of Israel needs the Torah. Stubborn, this. The Torah mentioned the problems that we have. So the Torah is the cure. But why the Gemara didn't say what really happened in reality? Because it wouldn't be true. When Hashem came to the Goim to offer them the Torah, did He really want the Goim to accept the Torah? Of course not. It, it never been a part of the plan. Never. It's not, it wasn't Hashem's plans. How do I know? It's very simple. Every mitzvah in the Torah is a memory of what? What event? Every mitzvah in the Torah that we say, every ceremony, we always say, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. A memory of the exodus of Egypt. How did he want to give it to the Goim? The Goim do, do, do not even know where Egypt was in those days. They, they have no record in Egypt, no history in Egypt. So if you give them mitzvah tefillin and they read, the Goim, the Goim Japan, Mr. Hishigawa, he stands like this, he say. Zecher in his language, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim. What is this? <laughs> he never been in Mitzrayim. <laughs> ah, he eat matzot now in Lela Seder with his wife, Bruce Lee and Ching Chang Chung. They sit in the table. <laughs> now they said, so the Bruce Lee comes and say, we're doing this, we're drinking wine and eat matzah because our father was in Mitzrayim. What Mitzrayim? <laughs> you in China all your life. There's no Hong Kong, whatever. So, uh, so how Hashem wanted to give it to them? He would have to change the whole Torah. So obviously, it wasn't the plan. So what is it? This is the trick here. Let's say your friend likes something that you have, and you don't want to give it to him. But you know this guy has such an Ayn Ara. If you don't give it to him, anyway, I lose it. <laughs> right? Let's see. He wants to borrow something for tonight in the wedding, like a watch, I don't know, something, a jewel. He wants to borrow it. Now, if you don't give it to him, you know that's, a, that's it. His eye, tomorrow it's breaking to pieces. You have record with this guy or girl, whatever. So to give it to him, you also don't want. So you say to him, you know, every time I wear this jewel, it makes me a rush. I need antibiotic problems. You want, you can have it. But I don't like it. So now he's thinking, oh, I'm going to take it. It's contagious. He doesn't want it. Hashem knew if he won't offer the Torah first to the Goim, they'll destroy us for stealing the Torah from us. You think they'll, they'll leave you alone? Right, that generation, they will come the whole world and grab the Torah and butcher us to pieces and steal the Torah. After they see God spoke to us, they leave us the Torah. They'll take it. So he played a trick on them. What's the trick? Kosher trick. He came to them and said, I have the Torah, you want it? The Goyim, they're very clever. They don't buy, in Hebrew you say chatul basak. You don't buy a cat in a bag. First check what's in a bag, no? <laughs> so the Goyim say, what's in it? So, depend which Goyim. When he came to the descendants of Esav, they asked, what's in it? He said, you should not kill. Well, they answer, oh, we live on our sword. Each one of us has a sword. The whole culture here is about killing. This nature, the strong one, is controlling. What does the Torah say about Esav? Al char tichye. You have to live by a sword. Now you're telling me you should not kill? Not for me. He comes to the Ishmaelim, stealing here, cheating there, stealing there. He says, what's in it? He says, you should not steal. It's not for us. He comes to Ammon and Moab. They say, what's in the Torah? Hashem says, you're not allowed gilui arayot. No relation, you know, scenes intimate scenes, not allowed this, not allowed that. He gave them the list. <laughs> he said, how can it be? Who is our father? Lot. Who is our mother's? Lot's daughters. They say, we came from Ammon. Ammon was the first boy that was born from Giloy Arayot. And we come from Moab. It's also... Our whole existence is thanks to Giloy Arayot. You're telling us no Giloy Arayot? For us, it's a great thing. Not interested. Bottom line, what was the trick here? Hashem knew the weakness of every nation. When he came to the leader, to the prophet, or to the king of that, leader, of that group, 
He knew what thing they will never agree to do. He could have told them when they ask what's in the Torah, Shabbat, eating chulen, snoring in bed, resting, sitting in your jacuzzi. He could have made it beautiful, no? There's two ways to present the Torah. You can present the restriction only and make people, ooh, ooh it's too hard. And then you show the beauty of the Torah. Great food, kiddush, family gathering, no? Sukkah, kids, that, Hanukkah, whatever. <laughs> Showing all the greatness. <laughs> but he showed them the side that he knew. They said, no, no, not for us. That's why, because they're not interested. You got to take the good and the bad together. Not that there's bad, chas v'shalom. Everything is good. But in order for you to appreciate the good, you need to have some bad around it. If everything was good in your eyes, you will never appreciate the good. When a person appreciates his wife, when he sees a witch across the street, he sees his friends married to a witch across the street, he hears all day the screaming, Moshe! I'll kill you! And see his wife, Hi, how are you, Levi? You need, you're hungry, you came for work. Can I do something for you? Uh, before he heard that scream, every day, Hi, how are you, my dear husband? Thank you, come here, I made you good. Uh, Oshpalo, whatever, you know. So, so now, he wouldn't appreciate it. Uh, every night, the same thing. Uh, serving me like a king. Ah, uh, when he heard, Moshe, I'll kill you! Leave me alone! Oh, very good. Same thing here. Everything in life, when you, be, you, you, you have eyes, you appreciate your eyes? No. When you appreciate your eyes, when you see a blind person with a stick. Excuse me, sir, can you help me to walk? What's here? What's over there? Wow, I'm lucky. Then you, you acknowledge the good, you understand? Before that, if everything was perfect, you wouldn't, appreciate, you wouldn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't enjoy it. To enjoy sweet, you have to have salt. If you taste salty, now you know how great is sweet. Or the other way around. That's the way their life is. You, have, you need to have black in order for you to appreciate the white. So far, any questions before we finish? Did the, did the righteous go in? Did they accept some, some of the righteous go in? Did they accept Torah? Yeah, I once said, in one of, I have a whole lecture about the Goim who wanted to accept the Torah. <coughs> Hashem did not deprive them. Later, they come back in reincarnations, and then they have the opportunity to convert. You see thousands of converts, left and right, every day they're coming from all over. 99.999999% from the descendants of Esav, not from Ishmael. Once in 70 years, you see one Arab. If you check his grand-grand-grandparents, you see he's not Ishmael. It's really not Ishmael, because the Zohar said the Arabs have, done, have no merit to convert. Only the descendants of Esav, for the mitzvah of kibud orim, kibud av. But Ishmael, pere adam yado bakol v'yad kol bo, even to convert, they don't have the merit. You have to understand, you know, when, when you do a mitzvah, let's say, you, let's say you give donation, and the rabbi comes to you every month and you give him a check or cash, whatever. Sometimes the Yetzer Hara, the even inclination tells you, oh, how do I get rid of him? It's already been going on for months, for years. How do I get rid of him? The person that thinks like this is making one very critical mistake. He doesn't understand. The Torah will remain, will stay forever. With or without your help. With or without donations. In the time of the desert, everybody learned Torah. They didn't need donations. When Hashem wants, you can learn Torah without donations. If Hashem wanted, He would make all the religious people very wealthy. But He wanted to give the merit to the wealthy people to participate in the huge treasure that calls Torah, since they're not learning. So He gave them an opportunity to become Zvulun. You have Issachar that learns Torah, his brother Zvulun, that is a businessman. If the businessman is clever, he invests in the right stock. What is it, Torah? Torah, saving souls, that's what Hashem wants. If you won't do it, the job will get done one day or the other. One time they had a big committee, in a time, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago. Rosh Yeshivat Ponovich, Arav Kahanman, he was standing over there, and they all were thinking, so who should we approach? How, where are we going to raise the funds? 
who should we go to? To this person, to that person, to this company. So Rav Kahneman say you have it wrong. The whole concept here is wrong. We, without, we don't have to approach anyone. The Torah is Hashem business. It will never go bankrupt. It's 100% secure. Hashem will run his Torah one way or the other according to his interest. He doesn't need the people's money to help the Torah. But he wants to give them a candy, a reward. So he gives them an opportunity. The, the rabbi knock on the door, help my yeshiva. Right away, you get millions of mitzvot every week. You don't want, no problem. Somebody else will do. They're giving you an opportunity and you complain. What the chutzpah? What the chutzpah? For his nonsense, the best car always every two years. The best coats, the best suits, 15 watches in a safe. Every week another diamond. Comes to Torah, when he comes to Olam Abba, he will pull his hair off. What a fool I was. I took the treasure that Hashem put in my hand and turned it into glass, into pieces of metal and put them in a safe or wore a stupid suit, and then it went to the garbage. And what was my end? Now I have no suit, no glass, no diamonds, no life, and no eternity, no Torah. That's it. Completely empty. I once told you, what's the difference between a rich person and a chacham, and a smart person? A rich person is rich only when he's dressed. The chacham, whether he's naked, whether he's dressed, is always chacham. You cannot take his wisdom away. You always have it. And I'll finish with a story that takes 30 seconds. One person came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, I don't feel good. I know I'm going to die soon. So I want to put my will in your hand. When I die, make sure you bury me with a long wool coat and five dollars in a packet of the coat. So the rabbi is saying, never heard such an odd request. What do you, you need five dollars in the grave? What? He said, no, rabbi, what kind of Jew you are? Don't you know that we're all going to resurrect one day? The Mashiach comes, it's going to be the resurrection of the dead. So I'm thinking, knowing who my kids are, how ungrateful they are to me, after all what I've done for them, I'm thinking, what happens if the resurrection of the dead will happen, let's say, soon? And it's going to be a freezing day. You know, it's New York, here, Rabbi. It could be 20 below zero. So that day I'm going to get up. I won't have a coat. What is the first thing I'm going to need? I'm going to need a warm coat and a, and a cup of coffee. That's why I say make sure I have $5 in my pocket. That is. So the rabbi told him, if your kids will not worry about a coat for you and a cup of coffee, you won't resurrect in the resurrection of the dead, my friend. If that's the kids you left here, you can dream on getting up. <laughs> My kids won't give me a cup of coffee. What kind of kid? The terrorists, their kids serve them with coffee and take care of their parents. Right? They murder innocent babies and a minute later they kiss the hand of their father. No contradiction. Right? Arafat used to go like this to the kids. Remember? They put him in a video, Saddam Hussein, all the kids. He came, he tapped them on the head. Just a minute ago, he butchered 20,000 Kurdish with chemical weapon. Just an hour ago. And now he comes. Oh, how are you, cutie? The Nazis, <coughs> after they put 500 base bees in the ovens, they had a dog. They play with the dog. How are you, cutie? There's no contradiction. You're a monster. There's no contradiction. It can be one minute a monster. One, mi one minute you're Santa Claus. <laughs> no contradiction. Murdering a, a night. In a day, standing in Macy's playing with the kids, at night he goes to hit people. Right? Without Hashem, without Irat Shammai, what do you expect from a person? Anything he will do is not a surprise. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Monday.